Good morning. I'm Cubby Pritchard, and I want to welcome you to Overbrook Presbyterian Church, where our mission is to love God, love our neighbor, and love each other. I would like to invite you to stand as you are able and join this morning in the singing of our call to worship. Please join us for our hymn of praise, One Way.
Let us join together in our prayer of confession. Watchful God, you know our plight. Offended, we have not believed your words. Complaining, we have betrayed your love. We are weak, wandering, and lost. Seeking to stand in our own strength, we fall. Strangers to your holiness, we wander. Defenseless against evil, we are lost. Shine your light into our darkness and guide us back to you. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the, and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning I had planned, well, there you are, Joshua. I had planned uh, not to do a time for young disciples because part of my sermon, I'm going to need the young disciples to help me translate it, I guess, um, to the larger congregation. So I was really nervous because I didn't see you earlier, Joshua, and I thought, great, Joshua's not here. Now half my sermon's down the tubes. But you're going to be here and you'll know, you'll know exactly when I need your help. Um, What I am going to do, though, this morning, or what we're going to do this morning instead of a time for young disciples, is we're blessed this morning to be receiving two new members by letter of transfer. So I'd ask uh, Stephen and Abe if you would come up and join me at this time. Just stand right here, but turn and face the congregation. 
For those of you who may not have met these gentlemen yet, this is Stephen Woody, and this is Abraham, but he likes to be called Abe Mickle. And um, Steve and Abe are joining by letter of transfer from Tuckahoe Presbyterian Church, where they have been members for well over six years. And I called and spoke to the pastor there and he spoke of them as only I wish I could speak of some of you from time to time. <laughs> Just glowing, glowing uh, report and said that uh, they would truly miss um, Stephen and Abe at their church. But they're coming to us for a couple of different reasons. One, the pastor at Tuckahoe is leaving um, at the end of this month to go take a call in Texas. And so um, there's going to be a change there. The other thing is Stephen and Abe live within walking distance of us, just down the road on Dumbarton. And they had to wait for a van to come pick them up and take them to Tuckahoe. And then after worship, wait for the van to bring them home. And as I'm sure some of you can understand, in football season, that meant they got home after the game started. And they just had about enough of that as they can take. So they can uh, worship with us and be home uh, on foot before the game starts. But really, they've expressed how much they've enjoyed uh, being a part of our worship services and how much they appreciate the warmth that you've shown to them and the way you've made them feel welcome here at Overbrook Presbyterian Church. So we look forward to having them as members. So Stephen and Abe just continue facing the congregation, but I just ask you this, will you promise to be faithful members of this congregation, giving yourself in every way to fulfill your calling as disciples of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I do. All right, let us stand with them and affirm what we believe by joining together in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe Christ is only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Stephen and Abe, welcome to Overbrook Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. We continue in our exploration of this scripture passage about the armor of God. And in today's verse that we're going to focus on, it talks about the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now, first, we're going to look at this helmet of salvation. Notice that everything else that we've been building in our suit of armor, the proper shoes, the proper belt, the proper breastplate, the proper shield, all of those are good things. All of those are necessary things. But guess what? Even with all of those things, even armored with all of those things, you could walk right up and crack somebody on the head and they're gone. I mean, they're out. 
I mean, think about not only as a soldier, but think about games like football. Players are not even allowed on the field without a helmet on their head because we're so vulnerable as human beings to head injuries. And in fact, even with a helmet on, if there's a play that causes a player's helmet to get knocked off, the player has to leave the field at least for one play before the player can come back on the field because they've lost their helmet and they just need to make sure that they're okay. I mean, in sports, if someone receives a concussion due to an attack on the head, they cannot even know which team they're playing on for or which direction on the field they're supposed to run. I mean, if they get injured in the head, they really get rendered useless in this battle that's taking place on the football field. And so the same way Paul understands that as Christian soldiers who are engaged in this battle, we need our head protected. We're susceptible Really, in this battle that Paul's talking about, we're susceptible. He's, he's pointing more towards this idea of psychological warfare. You know, where the enemy can say, yeah, those are really neat shoes you've got on, and that breastplate of righteousness isn't too bad, and that shield's looking pretty good. But you know you're not really saved. <laughs> You know that God didn't do that for you. You know that your sins are so bad that even God sending Jesus to die on the cross couldn't wipe away all your sins. And if the enemy can get us to doubt that and begin to fear and doubt, then the enemy can pretty much render all these other pieces of armor useless because he's attacked us, I think, where we're most vulnerable. There's a hymn I love um, called Beulah Land. Now, and there are a couple different versions uh, or a couple different hymns named Beulah Land. But let me just ask you a moment. Do you know what Beulah means or what Beulah land refers to? Anybody? I cheated. I looked it up about 10 minutes ago. You find it in the Bible in Isaiah because Israel has been in, um, oh, the word just left me, not isolation, um, where they've been taken out of their homeland. Exile, thank you, thank you. They've been in exile, away from the, the promised land. And the prophet Isaiah tells them that the day is coming when they will return to the promised land and their land will no longer be forsaken he says this, he says, your land will no longer be forsaken, it will be Beulah. Now, again, so what does that mean? Beulah is a word that translates as married. Married. So these hymns, Beulah land, is really saying married land, but not just married it's, he's, the prophet Isaiah is saying, your land will be married to God. Your land and its inhabitants will be joined in marriage to God. And he will look on you and he will look on your land as a bridegroom looks on and cares for his bride. In other words, you will be united as one with God. And so I, the, the hymn that I grew up singing in the old men's Sunday school class that I used to go to as a teenager was Beulah Land, and it said, Doubt and fear and, th and things of earth 
in vain to me are calling. None of them shall move me from Beulah land. For I'm standing on a mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking from a fountain that never shall run dry. I'm feasting on manna from a bountiful supply. For nothing shall move me from Beulah land. So this helmet of salvation is, is that helmet that assures us we are saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It is done. So when we have that helmet of salvation on, we are protecting ourselves from the wiles of the enemy that would so doubt and get us to allow fear back into our lives and doubt back into our lives. That helmet of salvation tells us we are united. We are married to God. And we have been saved through his love and through his grace. We, by putting on that helmet of salvation, are protecting ourselves from the psychological warfare that can be the most damaging to this battle that we're engaged in. The other thing that it talks about here is the sword of this. But wait a minute, I, I was going to skip over this, but I'm not going to because this idea of the helmet of salvation. Who in here has seen the movie Brother, Where Art Thou? All right, there's a scene. This movie is set. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. it it's worth a watch. Um, some of the movies I talk about in the pulpit, I can't say that about. But this one is worth a watch. It's set in Depression era United States. Uh, these three uh, guys break out of prison, the chain gang and are on this trip to try to get to the home of one of the three uh, guys. And so the movie is really about their journey and the things that happen to them along the way as they're trying to elude the police to get where they're going. And as they're making their journey, at one point they are walking through the woods and they hear some people singing and they look and they see people walking down to a river to get baptized. And they stop and they're listening to what the pastor's saying as he's putting people under the water and bringing them back up. And one of the three men, just kind of out of the blue, rushes down to the river, to the front of the line, and runs right up to the pastor. And you can't see, hear what they're saying to one another, but then in a moment, the pastor takes this fella and puts him down under the water and brings him back up. And when he comes up out of the water, he says to his friends, well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher's done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting is my reward. His friend says, what are you talking about? And he says, the preacher says all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. <laughs> and his friend says, I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. And he says, well, I was lying. And the preacher says that sin's been washed away too. Neither God nor man's got anything on me now, boys. Come on in. The water's fine. I love that. His embracing of his salvation that he had just received and had been symbolized through the baptism. And it's just to me like the enemy to say, you know, wait a minute, how can you be saved 
if you're saying you got your sin washed away for that piggly wiggly you knocked over in Yazoo, that means you're a liar. And instead of him going, oh, you know what? You're right. Maybe that salvation didn't really take. Maybe God didn't really save me. He just put on that helmet of salvation and says, you're right. I lied about that. And that sin got washed away too. That's what we're talking about. That confidence. Not in us. Not that now we're good and we're righteous and we're holy. But confidence not in what we've done, but confidence in what God has done for us. And that, to me, is what it means to be putting on the helmet of salvation. Now, this sword of the Spirit. This Joshua is where I might need some of your help. And Brad, I know you don't usually come up for young disciples, but I have a feeling you might be able to help me out a little bit here too. So there once was this little movie probably none of you have ever heard of called Star Wars, right? Now, a lot of us have seen at least one of the Star Wars movies, and if we haven't, we've probably heard about it. But if we could take all the Star Wars movies and boil them down to just one sentence, for somebody who's never seen one of the Star Wars movies, in just one line, how, what could we tell them to say the Star Wars movies are basically about? What would we say, do you think? Did you hear that? He said... I can't believe, I, like, I thought about meeting with him ahead of time, but I knew I didn't need to. He said, all the Star Wars movies are basically about good versus evil. That's what it all boils down to, good versus evil. Now, in the Star Wars movies, what are the good guys called? Jedis, that's right. They're called Jedis. And who are the bad guys? Sith, that's right. You've got Jedis, which are the good guys, and Siths, which are the bad guys. And, you know, this passage today starts off talking about this battle, about good versus evil evil, about the dark forces that we are embattled against. And I just couldn't help but think about Star Wars, and it just is telling a very similar story about good versus evil. And, and it takes many different forms, but it's talking about this battle of good versus evil. Now, Joshua, a Jedi, has a really important weapon. What is a Jedi's most important weapon? Yep. One. Yep, that's right. Now, what does a lightsaber... Ah! What in, in the real world, I'm going to move this. Can you bring my volume down a little bit? So a lightsaber is like what kind of like more regular human weapon? A sword, maybe? Yeah. And what does the scripture today say we have is the sword of the spirit now it says the sword of the spirit is god's word and
we're also told that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So isn't it interesting that scripture tells us that God's word is a sword and is light, which sounds a lot like a lightsaber, you know? Now, what's really interesting to me about lightsabers in Star Wars is in the first movie, when Luke first gets his lightsaber and he's trying to learn how to use it, he's going through some training. And if you haven't seen that movie, there's a round ball or orb that floats around in the air and it's called a Jedi training remote. And so what it does is if, if I had one of those, it would be floating around here in front of me and shooting at me with little uh, lasers that don't, I mean, they, they're not going to kill me, but they don't feel good. You know, you, the, you can tell when you get hit by one, it hurts. And the, the idea is that you use your lightsaber as the laser comes towards you. You use your lightsaber to block the uh, little thing that's being shot at you. And poor Luke Skywalker, the main character, he keeps getting hit with these little lasers. He's tr trying his best, and he keeps uh, missing, and the little lasers keep hitting him, and his teacher's name is who? Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi Kenobi, yes. His teacher is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Luke is struggling not to get hit with these lasers, and he's doing a terrible job and Obi-Wan takes a helmet and puts it on Luke's head with a shield that's covering his eyes. And he says, well, I was doing bad at it before. How am I going to do any better now that I can't see? And Obi-Wan tells him, instead of using your eyes, Joshua, what does he tell him to use? The force, right. Well, guess what the force is in Star Wars? It's this invisible power that you can't see, that it kind of exists all around people. Some people are totally unaware of it and seem to be totally unaffected by it. But Jedis who know about it and learn about it are able to benefit from the power of the source. So with this helmet on and with his inability to see, he begins to use the force and he begins to be able to hit and block all of those little lasers that are coming at him. Well, you know what? I don't mean to talk bad about George Lucas, but isn't it bad to copy what other people have already written? You know? And, and in Scripture today, we're talking about this battle of good and evil. We're talking about the sword of the Spirit, which kind of sounds like maybe a lightsaber and the force. Because, yes, a lightsaber is a powerful weapon, and yes, Anybody could pick it up and do certain things with it, but it can't be used to its full potential unless you have the benefit of the force. Well, guess what? God's word is our sword, but it's the sword of the spirit. In other words, to me, it's saying it's marrying the word of God with the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's interesting to me, too, with the force in the Star Wars movies, young Anakin, or young Luke Skywalker, he starts off like trying to control the force. 
like trying to possess it and control it and and use it to his advantage. And what he ends up learning over time is the way you really use the force is to surrender to the force and to allow the force to fill you and guide you and lead you. Again, George Lucas, he had to have read the Bible somewhere along the way or been raised in the church or something because this, I mean, it's almost like it's right out of Scripture. This spiritual battle between good and evil, this ultimate weapon of the Jedi, the lightsaber, the the sword of the Spirit. Because, you know, it says that even the demons know Scripture. When Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, the devil tried to use Scripture against him. He he tried to say, you know, hey, the Bible says that God will not allow you to be... uh, hurt or damaged or bruised and so you know throw yourself off of this and God will send down angels to save you but Jesus who is filled with the spirit uses that weapon in a way that brings victory and causes the enemy to retreat so you know another thing is As powerful as a real lightsaber is, and as beneficial as a real lightsaber is to a Jedi Knight, how useful do you think it is if the Jedi gets ready to go into battle and realizes he left his lightsaber at home? Do you think it's going to do him much good then? sees him battle and he left it at home? No. And as powerful as God's word is, as we're attacked, as we're engaged in battle by the enemy, it really doesn't do us much good if we've left it at home. And so we need to be in God's word, studying God's word, learning God's word. Now, I love the idea of scripture scripture memorization but some people you mentioned scripture memorization and it's almost like they're listening to one of my sermons their eyes just glaze over and they look like they're somewhere else right because it just has no appeal to them I encourage folks to do scripture memorization but even if you don't do that just being in God's Word and reading God's Word and familiarizing yourself with God's Word. I can't tell you how many times I've been in prayer over something that's just been troubling me or I've been struggling with. And as I'm in the midst of prayer, it's as if the Holy Spirit just brings a scripture verse to my mind or plants it in my heart. Not one necessarily that I've memorized, but just plants those words in my heart and gives me strength and courage and and a way forward. Now, I didn't necessarily have to have it memorized, but I had to have some familiarity with it. I had to have read it. I had to have studied it. I had to have known about it. And then the Holy Spirit, the Christian force, if you will, then takes that and brings it alive in my life. Now, the last thing I just want to point out is all of these items of armor up until this point are purely defensive pieces of armor. As I mentioned the other day, you don't think of somebody attacking somebody else with their belt of truth or charging at the enemy with their breastplate in their hand. It just, that's not what they're for. They're for defensive purposes to protect them from the um, offensive nature of the enemy. The sword of the spirit is that one piece of the armor, as it's called by Paul, 
that really serves two purposes. Jesus demonstrates the first really as a defensive weapon because as he's in the wilderness with Satan, Satan is attacking him time and time again. And Jesus is using his knowledge of Scripture and his reliance on the Holy Spirit to give him those Scriptures as a defensive weapon to ward off the attacks of the evil one. But then throughout most of the rest of Jesus' life, he demonstrates how the sword of the Spirit, God's Word, is used as an offensive weapon. Because he preached and he taught the truth. He spread the good news of the gospel. And so to me, Paul is telling us, here's what we're called to do. The, the hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. We are called to be soldiers, to be engaged in that spiritual battle. And yes, it's about protecting ourselves from the advances of the enemy, to be prepared, to, to not be knocked down and knocked out and taken out of the fight. But at the end of the day, all of that protection, all of that defense so that we can take that spirit, that sword of the spirit, and march forward. What does the hymn say? Onward, Christian soldiers. Doesn't say retreat. Doesn't even say just hold your ground. It says onward, Christian soldiers. Marching as to war. Because it is a battle. And yes, we're called to protect ourselves, but we're also called to do what? Go into all the world making disciples. And if we're clothed with the full armor of God and the sword of the Spirit, we'll be blessed to be a part of the victory that God has already won on our behalf. Amen. Please join us for our hymn of response, standing as you're able.
God as the giver of all good gifts, let us respond in faithfulness as we bring forth God's tithes and our offerings. It's always a blessing each Sunday to see each of you here. Um, I do want to just take a moment and um, issue a a special welcome to Chris Carpenter. She's seated seated to the right of Stuart um, over there. Uh, Chris is a friend of mine from Yorktown, uh, is a member of the church I serve there in Yorktown, and it's always nice to see you. Friendly face. Uh, your son and daughter-in-law live here. Okay. Any grandchildren yet? Oh, and another son in Midlothian with grandchildren. So we may see her more often because I know the pull that my grand my grandchildren will have me get in a car and drive for fourteen hours straight to to see them. So. Uh, Midlothian's a lot closer than that, so welcome. It's a joy to have you with us this morning, Chris. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, you overwhelm us with your generosity and with your provision. Lord, make us faithful stewards of all that you have provided. Lord, protect us from the wrong thinking of how we will manage what we have. And instead, always remind us that we are called to faithfully manage and use what is yours and what you have provided that we may manage it and use it and spend it in ways 
that bring glory and honor to your name and are truly to the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we lift up today all who are suffering and in need, all who have experienced loss, all who are facing illness, emotional, mental, physical, and all those who care for them and provide for them. Lord, we lift up the leaders of the world. We pray that though some seek to follow you and please you and others do not, Lord, we would pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of them and those who are serving a different master. Lord, would turn to you and lead in ways that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, in a world that's filled with half-truths and misinformation, we rejoice that you have provided us through your word the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Lord, allow us to stand on it and yet to share it with a world that I believe is truly hungry for truth. So that one day, not only those of us gathered here, but all throughout this world would bend a knee and pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us for our sending hymn.
I just want to make something clear before the benediction. When I was introducing Stephen and Abe, I said their pastor spoke of them in ways I only wish I could speak of some of you. I just want you to know that at a church I served in Florida, our youth pastor and I went to a conference, and at that conference we had to introduce each other. And when he introduced me to the group, he said, this is Pastor Mark. Um, I work with him. I'm the youth director. And something you need to know about Pastor Mark is sarcasm is his love language. <laughs> and so please know when I say things like that, I love you. <laughs> and I love being the pastor of this church. And I love the blessing that it is to be here with you and to be your pastor. So please don't take offense at my foolishness. It is my failed attempt at expressing love. Go now with the sure knowledge, the helmet of salvation, the sure knowledge of the love of God who not only loves you, but to, but to whom you are Beulah. And go in the grace and peace that is ours in Jesus Christ and in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>